Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, so I'm Pascal. I'm from the Square uh, New York office. We opened the office like six months ago. Um, and so I'm a new transplant to New York, uh, which has which been a lot of fun. So tonight, what I'm going to focus on is how to avoid outages. Um, and really kind of the underlying theme of what I'm going to present, which are kind of a survey of a bunch of insights uh, that we've learned you know, at Square and in previous companies that, that we all came uh, from, is technology is great, but what's even better is to have a culture of safety uh, and actually have kind of a focus around uh, kind of this DevOps integration uh, and, and how to make things you know, secure and safe, you know, from the ground up. So you think about Square, we've grown from this really tiny little company uh, four years ago to running, you know, more than 20 billions of payments today. Uh, we have over a, mil over a million merchants using us, uh, you know, every month. Uh, and whenever we have outages, you know, there's real people who are hurt who are unable to kind of sell their products. And so for us, the focus on on, on safety and the focus on having our system stable has been absolutely constant. So I thought I'd start with uh, someone who's kind of an inspiration for me, Paul O'Neill, who's the CEO of a former CEO of Alcoa, uh, who managed the company from 87 uh, to 99, so over a 10-year uh, uh, tenure. And over his tenure, he was able to kind of multiply the net profits from roughly 200 million, which is not too bad, to over 1.4 billion of net revenue. So enormous growth over, uh, over his tenure. And on the first earnings call uh, after he was nominated, uh, he kind of uh, freaked out everybody on the street. So he was on the call and he said, well, you know, I'm going to focus on safety. Like, I'm not going to focus on market share or productivity or whatever, I'm going to focus on worker safety and that's going to be my single focus uh, for the next few years. And everybody thought he was absolutely crazy uh, to, to basically focus on you know, the employees and focus on uh, the, the factories. But what happened is through many conversations, uh, he was able to kind of change the tone in the company. One of the things he did is he gave his personal phone number, at the time there wasn't a lot of cell phones, uh, his home phone number to every employee in the company. Um, and he said, you know, if there's any issue related to safety, call me personally any time of the day and I'll attend to it. And so one day, you know, someone in a factory uh, in a remote part of, of the country uh, noticed something wrong with a conveyor belt and you know, decided, okay, well, you know, the CEO asked me to be proactive about this. I'll call him up at his house. So he calls up, you know, Paul O'Neill. He's probably about 10 layers away from the CEO. Uh, you know, this big, massive company, over 50,000 employees, uh, and talks to him about, you know, the fact that this conveyor belt is broken. And so, yeah, exactly. Focus on safety. Um, and so, uh, Paul O'Neill basically, you know, took the call, thanked the guy, uh, called the general manager of that of that plant. And by the next morning, the conveyor belt was fixed. And little by little, through those practices, not only was he able to improve productivity for obvious reasons, you know, when you have things that work smoother, you know, you increase productivity, but he was also able to kind of create a real conversation with employees and basically change uh, the setting in the company and deunionize the company uh, and make it just more efficient all throughout. And that's one of the many ways that he succeeded. Uh, and I think it's a nice kind of analogy in a world that's maybe a little far from us, you know, manufacturing, uh, to, to kind of take into uh, something that is so kind of ephemeral, you know, software. And, you know, very much like what Greg described, you know, you always speak about code, something than profit. Uh, I'll actually say that, you know, there's two part of our job. We write code and then we remove code. And we're really happy when we, remove, when we remove code. And then in between, there's a bunch of things that happen. And so we'll kind of go on a journey through each step and look at you know, different techniques for each of them. So once we've re written code, we're actually going to bless that code. You know, some people call that quality assurance, testing, you name it. But the whole concept is, You've got code, and you need to basically make a determination on whether that code is good or bad. 
then you take that and you ship it to your customers in order to get value uh, and to basically deliver value to those customers. Um, hopefully the code is going to live and so you have to maintain it and make sure that it continues to behave as expected. And then you know, at some point you hope to profit uh, from that code in whatever way and finally you remove it. You know? And so uh, the, the first thing that we're going to start by is the actual coding part. Um, I could probably do you know, full talk just on coding or many, many talks. People spend their whole life on how to code effectively. Uh, there are two things which, which I wanted to mention as you know, little snippets of you know, think to think about you know, and kind of take a step back about how to write code. So one of the issues I've noticed often is when you're writing front end systems, uh, things which basically access a bunch of back ends, uh, I've noticed developers mixing IDs. So you have a customer ID, you have a user ID, you have a basket ID, and then you know, you're not careful, uh, code gets complicated, you try to batch a request, and then you're going to use one kind of ID for another kind of ID. And so that leads to you know, obvious bugs, data leaks, you name it. So two techniques that, um, that I've seen used in practice, you know, the first one actually comes from Google Checkout back in 2006 uh, is typed IDs. So basically, you know, leverage the type system uh, to create kind of this surrogate type uh, and type annotation type tokens uh, to be able to have the type system basically tell you that you're mixing things incorrectly. The other one uh, is simply using textual IDs uh, and randomizing those textual IDs so that they have a much lower probability of colliding. Uh, one more trick is to actually add kind of a type uh, identifier at the end of the ID. The reason you would want to add it at the end is to make sure that you can continue to have high selectivity if you ever write them in databases and do kind of search on that. Um, so that's kind of the, the first thing on, on coding. The other is testable configuration. So one of the systems we built at, at Square is called TrackOn. It's a reverse proxy. So think about you know, Nginx or Varnish. Uh, but the focus of that system was around testable configuration. So one of the things we noticed is as the company grew, people got scarier, you know, it got scarier and scarier to actually modify, you know, that top level configuration that basically spreads the traffic across all of our different backend system. Uh, and so we were kind of racking our brains about how to make it better. And so what we came up with is, you know, we had like some rudimentary amount of testing around Nginx, uh, but we decided to shift gears completely and instead build a system where, by design, the configuration of the system was very, very testable. And so we basically ended up with a reverse proxy that has a configuration that is very easy to read, very stylistically written, uh, almost like a mini uh, domain-specific language. And then uh, with that comes a testing language where you can express all your rules. So if you're on one team and you actually care about five different kind of URLs uh, moving into your system and being routed to your system, you can encode all of those invariants and then know that you know, whatever other people are going to change that configuration, they won't break your system. And so that has really kind of uh, catalyzed our ability to kind of behave uh, as a group and all kind of contribute to that. So then, you know, once you're kind of done with coding, um, you have to basically test things or, or bless code. Uh, Test-driven development today is not controversial. Uh, it's basically the run-of-the-mill thing that everybody does. Uh, a decade ago, it wasn't the case. Like, there's many systems on which I worked, uh, even in financial industry, uh, doing routing orders in major banks, uh, you know, wires, uh, checks, and basically processing for those kind of entities that had literally absolutely no tests. You know, three, millions hours of, three million lines of code, not a single test. Uh, you know, there's a few reasons that, you know, that I, I decided to pick, you know, it's good living documentation, good for collaboration, it's a good way to encode invariants and basically express to other engineers what you had in your brain when you developed it. Uh, but there are two things uh, on the test-driven development uh, topic that I want to touch on. So one is the concept of gold tests, uh, which is essentially 
tests that can only be modified by a subset of the engineering team. And the reason you would want to do that is you know, you're going to have maybe five or so or ten or so regression tests that basically cover a very key aspect of your system. And you'll make sure that only a few amount of people can ever touch that. So you can change libraries, you can evolve how things change internally, you can, you can change um, messaging systems, you can change you know, what database you actually back your system by, but those tests, which are like the golden tests that encode you know, the most important invariants, uh, those you know, should never need to change um, when you change kind of the underlying mechanics. Uh, and by restricting it to a very small amount of the team, you basically create an implicit uh, ownership group of people who are directly responsible for making sure the system actually behaves the way uh, that it should. And then, obviously, you can use you know, technology or not to do that. Uh, in very, very big companies, you would want to have technology and post-commit or pre-commit hooks. Uh, but in smaller companies, it's something that's really easy uh, to introduce with just a comment. The other thing is having this notion of expressive tests. So basically tests that transcend you know, simple code, but are by themselves uh, kind of a domain-specific language. And so I'll jump to one example that comes directly from our code base. Uh, the system that it describes, and, and we're going to go through each step little by little, um, is, uh, is basically an accounting system that receives events from many different upstream processing systems, and then based on those events, uh, decides what are the appropriate accounting actions that need to be applied. Uh, those accounting uh, actions would be, you know, we're in going to increase your account by $20, and then by the end of the day, you'll get you know, a check uh, electronically sent to you. Uh, and so what is basically going on is you, know, you have a feed. Basically, we're pulling events from another system. And then you know, we expect the system to be in a specific state then something's happened, and then we expect the system to be in another state. And the, um, where you end up in the program you know, is obviously different than, than before. And nothing that is described here is actually tied to the implementation of the system. So at one point, we had to change the back end completely from one, from one system to, to the other to be able to kind of scale uh, to the next 10x. And most of the tests that were expressed uh, that way uh, didn't actually need to be rewritten. We were able to just take them, you know, swap the implementation, uh, and that actually gave us enormous confidence that the new implementation was exactly the same as before, because no one actually went there and rewrote the test, possibly with some bug in the test being rewritten. It was really just a copy and paste uh, and reusing the, the files automatically. So then, Another point on test-driven development and you know, looking at it from another angle, usually what, what I've noticed in companies is everybody is super gung-ho about doing test-driven development, right? You speak about uh, someone who's working on his own little project or uh, maybe two other colleagues. Um, you know, everything is going to be tested. You know, there's, there's no users, but it's really kind of a, a way of developing code. So you're in this, you're in this space where you know, you're at the beginning of your code base, beginning of time, beginning of your, of your company, beginning of your organization. Uh, the quality requirements on your system are actually quite low. Because maybe you're the only one who are using it, or maybe it's only friends and family who are using your system. So the asks on your system are quite low. And then things evolve. You know, maybe you raise a seed round, or uh, you get a little more traction. You get a little, little more people who use it. Uh, and so you're going to kind of evolve uh, in the state where the asks on your system, the asks on the quality of the system, are increased. And so maybe you're able to kind of track uh, by automated testing. But most of the time, you're going to start introducing manual testing. Uh, and that could be as simple as, you know, each time I do a deploy, I actually go through the website or I load up the app and I make sure that it works, right? Like most people wouldn't look at that as manual testing, but really if you were to classify it, it's part of ensuring quality. Uh, and it's part of, of the whole process of doing code. Uh, and then, you know, there's two ways to go from there. One is, you know, you continue to grow 
the quality requirements continue to grow, and then things start to diverge very quickly into two buckets, uh, which I contend are non-overlapping. Uh, either you get sloppy and you don't continue to do testing and you cover the gap uh, by doing manual testing. Or you, know, you continue to work on it and you're able to keep that, you know, maybe you do a little more manual testing than you were before, but in proportion you're still about in the same ballpark. And then obviously what happens from there is you, know, you get completely diverging uh, kind of companies. You know, companies who are very slow at operating because they have a very wonderful process to produce the code and then a very wonderful process to test the code and then they discover something is bad and they go back to square one and they redo the whole thing. Or you get you know, the companies that we actually like to work at, uh, which Etsy is a very good example of, um, which basically test things you know, and, and are able to continue even with very, very high demands on their system uh, to be mostly um, automated. Uh, and obviously, you know, caution retail, don't be that company. Um, so moving on uh, into what happens between blessing the code and shipping the code, uh, a lot is done about code analysis. So you have code and then you're going to use a bunch of techniques uh, to be able to do, to basically vet that before the code goes to production. It's not, you know, going to production yet but you're trying to make one more determination on how that code is going to behave. So what we've all learned kind of in school is the theory is very much decomposed between static analysis, which pulls mostly from algebra, uh, and dynamic analysis, which pulls mostly from code instrumentation, algorithmics, and probability. And because those two fields of study are so different, you know, most analyses are in one bucket or the other. Uh, but then fast forward, you know, once you're an engineer and you're actually building system, uh, the angle that we're looking at is, you know, what tool can I draw from? Uh, and, you know, among all of the techniques that are available to me, uh, what should I draw from? And I think that a better dichotomy is what you can draw from that will work pre-production, before the code is actually running in front of customers, and things which run post-production, you know, once you've shipped it uh, to production. And, very different than the static dynamic kind of dichotomy. So pre-production, uh, type checking is one that you obviously do for, for languages which are type checked, uh, Java, C++, Go. Um, but even for dynamic languages, you, know, you can actually use uh, tools that will recover types. You know, one of the projects that, that I worked on at Google uh, was the Google Closure Compiler, which basically tries to recover types in JavaScript. Uh, and it was really instrumental to you know, being able to ship Gmail, you know, very, very big code base, um, and you know, being able to kind of organize the code of 30, 40, 50 different engineers around it. Uh, and then obviously, you know, testing, which we covered, you know, linters. Uh, another example is what I like to call the for forbidden call analysis. So in regardless of the language, regardless of libraries you use, there's always you know, this expert knowledge of, yeah, never call this library because it doesn't do what you want or never do things this way or that way. Uh, and it's kind of a tribal knowledge that's passed from one developer to the other. Uh, maybe it's going to be on a wiki page somewhere. You actually encode it uh, into a test or into a linter or, you know, some form of script that actually does that automatically. You know, instead of being tribal knowledge, it becomes kind of automated learning that you can inject into your team. You know, it's basically, well, run that tool and it'll teach you about how to write code here at our company. So that's all the category of basically pre-analysis, things that you would do uh, before the code ships. Once the code has shipped, uh, the, the, the major things are, you know, you're going to log things, you're going to gather metrics, you're going to monitor, um, you're going to do invariant checking, which is just a fancy way to do, uh, to do monitoring. You know, if you're denormalizing data, maybe it's good to actually check like once a day that you're denormalizing correctly. Uh, because while your test may be correct, you know, when you're in a nice sandbox environment on your uh, CI machine, when it's running in the wild, potentially with some concurrency issue which, is, which are hard to debug, you may actually discover, you know, that there's some uh, incorrect denormalizations. Uh, yes, we had like incorrect denormalization in some accounting systems, you know, early on at Square. Uh, funny story, it was like three days before Thanksgiving, and I noticed that 
one of the operations, basically inverse the sign. So basically, we had, you know, if you owed Square money, like, you know, you, uh, we would try to debit your account for $200. If we were unsuccessful at taking your $200, it would come back as a, you know, failed, uh, you know, failed debit. And then we would turn around and be like, oh, well, now we owe you $200. Here's $200. <laughs> uh, and luckily, you know, we had launched only at beta. And so I think we lost under 1000 bucks because of that bug. Uh, but, you know, I projected that if we had left that bug, you know, one more week, it would have been like 10x. And then one more week would be 10 more x, uh, which, you know, ends up being like real money. Um, so speaking about metrics and alerting, uh, I'd like to kind of do one deep dive into uh, metrics versus checks. So uh, what I call a check is you know, what you typically have in a monitoring tool like Nagios, which is a very binary signal on your system. You, know, like you're, you have a probe, you're looking at one very specific thing of your system, and you're saying, you know, is it working or is it not? It's a very binary uh, kind of notion. So the, the example I'd like to, to go through, you know, think about some FTP connection that you have to some banking partner. Um, and you, know, you need to be connected to that partner to exchange files. And so you basically have a probe that is going to check whether you're connected to them or not. Obviously, if you're not connected, you know, some engineer would get online, maybe call the bank, try to debug what networking issue is going on, uh, because you need to be able to pass files back and forth. Uh, but as many of you know, uh, banks actually operate in, in very interesting ways, uh, which is most banks close their system on Saturday. So they're like, well, you know, we're not open for business, we're just going to shut down our systems. Uh, and so many of our partners actually at Square, you know, they're just not available on Saturday. Uh, so we shouldn't even try to connect. So what we basically code is, uh, there's you know, a 12 hour period in our Nagios checks where we don't actually run the probe because we know that it would be uh, flaky or give us, you know, uh, it would basically tell us that the system is wrong. Uh, at other times, obviously, the system you know, is indeed wrong, which is uh, highlighted by the little red thing, and that would basically trigger a correct page to an engineer, uh, which would then you know, be investigated. Uh, but if you look at that you know, from, a, from a system standpoint and you know, from an operator standpoint, you actually don't get a lot of information in the system. And most importantly, you're unable to basically get insight into that blue box. So another way to do it is you know, turn it into, uh, into a metric, like a binary metric, uh, you know, 0 or 1, uh, and run it all the time. And then you know, you're going to run your probe, so you get the raw data as a metric, uh, but then you're going to have some smarter analysis on whether you should send the page or not. Uh, so that's kind of you know, normal evolution number one. Uh, in, in the case above, you know, the probe itself is coded to have this 12 hour uh, buffer where regardless of the underlying result, it, it says things are good. You know, one more evolution, you know, really going into the world of metrics, is to actually measure the time it takes to connect. Uh, and then, you know, you get a much more interesting uh, view into what is going on in that system. Uh, and you're actually able, you know, if you look at you know, the red on the very first line, compared to the metrics on the bottom, you're able to see the outage coming along. And so you can actually respond probably much before the outage is going to come along. Uh, and so you know, the, the, the whole point is you know, try to kind of challenge yourself you know, whenever you have those kind of binary signals about your system. You know, challenge yourself to think about how to turn into something that is more continuous, that basically paints a bigger story of what is actually going on. Uh, because you know, in, in a post-mortem, post uh, uh, you can actually get a lot more insight about what's going on. Another kind of angle, another way to look at uh, this world of alerting and, and monitoring is to think about when should you page an engineer, which is a very costly operation, because you're waking up someone uh, who actually, you know, whose primary job is to write code and add value uh, rather than being interrupted, um, versus issue a report uh, that can, you know, basically describe outstanding issues that can then be you know, resolved maybe in a 12 hour period, 24 hour period, maybe in a one week period. Uh, and so one way to look at it is this two by two matrix where 
you're, you're going to have whether the signal of, of the outage that is happening or about to happen is precise or imprecise. You know, are you able to basically determine uh, whether things are bad or not? Uh, and the other is, do you need to respond to that immediately or can you respond with a delay? So the first bucket is actually quite simple, which is if you can tell precisely that there's a problem and you know that you need to respond immediately, then obviously a page is the appropriate answer uh, and an alert is going to be you know, appropriate. For all cases uh, you know, where a deferred response is okay, a report is much better. And so in, in the previous company I was at, Wealthfront, we actually built a very complicated reporting system where many systems would be able to essentially issue reports and then in the morning as the operator, you know, the person on call, you'd basically log onto that dashboard and you would have to kind of sign off on every report. Uh, and we even had like some formatters that would basically show you, you know, lines of the report that were interesting or anomalous or different than the report you got the day before. And it was really kind of, you know, there was a lot of work that went into kind of this reporting system. Uh, and even in cases where you can, you know precisely that the problem uh, is occurring, if you can have a different response, you know, I contend that you should force yourself to respond to it in a deferred way rather than interrupt, you know, essentially your manufacturing process. And then the other, the last case is, uh, when things are imprecise and you actually need to respond to it immediately, you know, that should be like a fatal flaw of the system. Like that's something that you know, needs to be actively worked on you know, to be able to either push it into the deferred zone or push it into uh, the precise zone. Uh, but that should be a red flag and it should be like an architectural flaw. Like these things should, should just never happen. Uh, does that kind of ring a bell? To Great. Cool. So moving on to maintaining code, uh, one of the things that we do at Square, uh, which I love and I discovered, uh, is fix it weeks. So every quarter we set a, a, a way one week to fix things. And there's absolutely no top down mandate. It's just, hey, here's a week back. Do whatever you want to make the world better. You know, it could be open sourcing things, it could be documentation, it could be working on, you know, the alerts, uh, it could be building a dashboard to be able to see metrics better. Uh, we had someone build a debugging tool uh, where you could basically use kind of the Chrome developer tools to see interactions between an iOS app and server side. Um, you know, it could be whatever you want. Uh, but it's really about, you know, let's make sure we kind of pay our technical debt. Uh, and that's been kind of a nice, nice way to also set the tone and set the culture of, you know, let's care about, let's care about our system. Yeah. Sorry? In the Agile sense, do you demo at the end of this fix it week or do you just let it go and do the weeks of all the record? Oh, yeah. Do we demo at the end of the week? Um, in some cases, we have demoed, yeah. Um, you know, definitely show and tell to other engineers or uh, it can be, you know, a demo in many different ways. Uh, in the early days of the company, the, the, the all hands that we have every week, which we call the town square, uh, would actually be all, you know, fix it. Uh, and it worked pretty well uh, up until the point where, first of all, there were too many engineers to actually show all the work that was going on, and it got too technical for people to actually engage. Uh, and so it was done in, in kind of you know, poster style or, or other ways. Uh, but yeah, usually the, there is that aspect of you know, kind of the bragging of, hey, I did this great thing, uh, which kind of reinforces the culture. Another kind of cultural hack is um, you know, when you log it into a terminal in our, in our systems, if you're in staging, the terminal is green and it has a green prompt. When you're in production, it has a red prompt with a big red logo. Uh, and that actually wasn't always the case. It, it came out of an outage where you know, an engineer logged onto a machine, had a couple terminals open, staging in production, obviously, because it's always like that, that outages happen. Uh, and he wanted to test something on a Redis host. Uh, and he was like, okay, well, I'm going to test it. And he's like, oh, well, it doesn't work. I guess I won't do that in production. 
oh shit, that was production. <laughs> and then that happened. <laughs> Um, and you know, believe it or not, like that was like you know, 20 minutes outage because he took like some main Redis that was used for locking of our payment system. Um, and then we were like, well, you know, if we had colors, it wouldn't happen. So let's just put colors. Um, so when things bad happen, uh, you know, postmortem is really important. Like again, kind of a cultural hack to some extent, um, or at least something to kind of reinforce that focus on safety. Um, and at a high level, the three things to focus is, you know, when, like, when do you actually do that? Like, all the time, whenever something bad happens. Um, we had people get stuck in an elevator in our new, in our new facilities in San Francisco. We did a post-mortem, you know. We actually analyzed, you know, why. Um, and a big focus is to make sure it's blameless. Uh, it's really about you know learning rather than finding who actually had the you know who was at fault for the issue because if you look at an organization the size of Square but really any kind of software organization or any kind of manufacturing organization uh, it's a failure of the organization uh, to have issues in production and have issues arise um, you know in front of customers it's not like you can't hire you know really well and you know, hire great people and then look at them and tell them, well, you, know, you just need to be smarter. Like, that doesn't really work. Like, it doesn't actually logically compute. And so you know, if the outcome of your postmortem is, well, you just should not have done X, Y, Z, you're basically telling the person you should just be smarter. Uh, and that shouldn't be an acceptable answer out of postmortems. So you know, ways to do it is like, uh, go through a timeline so that everybody in the room is actually in sync of what happened. Uh, it's also a really good forcing function to gather precise forensics. It also highlights you know, maybe flaws in logging, metrics, et cetera, where you're unable to gather forensics after the event. So you're not even able to kind of debug what happened. Uh, and then you know, what happened well, you know, there's always good things that happen in an outage. Maybe the team collaborated particularly well. Maybe you know, a system had to be properly de uh, decomposed or modularized such that even though it failed, the impact on the customers was actually small. Um, and there's always kind of good things to actually come out and you know, learn from and push on. Uh, then things that actually didn't go bad, uh, didn't go well, and then things that went really, really, really terrible. Um, and so we actually put it in those kind of three categories. Uh, you know, smiley, neutral, sad face. And then most postmortems should have action items. Uh, you know, they should have some follow through. Something actually happened, so you should take at least one action. Um, in the early days, you know, at Square, we used to come out of a postmortem with like 20, 30 different things that we had to do. It's like, well, you know, we should like, uh, you know, improve the Linux kernel so that it uh, does this automatically. And you're like, well, we'll never just work on that. Like, you know. Come on, we have a bunch of features to build. Um, and so we actually forced ourselves to have no, no more than two or five action items, like something very manageable that everybody in the room can actually nod to and say, yeah, you know, we can realistically get that done in the next week or two. Um, and it's also kind of a good forcing function to be realistic about what you can improve in the moment. Uh, and if those postmortems happen, you know, if there's more and more outages, uh, then there's other kind of techniques that can be used. Uh, the other thing is to kind of focus on, on root cause analysis and try to kind of understand you know, what was the actual issue. Uh, but the secret is you know, there is no root cause. Uh, like, <laughs> like it's pointless to even look at it. You know, uh, there, it just doesn't exist. So we had this funny outage, at least in retrospect it's funny, uh, where uh, a network engineer had to change uh, a router on our systems. Uh, and so very you know, simple operation, basically unbinding some ports and re rebinding others, uh, except that there were two lines and he copy pasted and you know, didn't change like, the second line correctly, had it reviewed by someone else, and then someone else looked over the shoulder, was like, yeah, that's fine, you know, ship it. Um, and so he goes on the router, you know, does that action, lights goes on, uh, and he's like, okay, well, I'll just you know, undo, roll back. You know end of the story, except what he had done is he basically cut the cord uh, between our main payments, payment system 
and a cache that it was using, uh, which shouldn't be a big issue, except instead of using the cache as a secondary store, uh, that payment system had a bug and used it as a primary store. And so by cutting the cord, the system you know, went into trash mode, launched a bunch of exception. Those exceptions made it to, act to actual clients, like client apps, you know, iOS and Android. Those applications went into uh, a mode where you know, if they're unable to run the card, they're going to automatically void uh, the card. Uh, by th if you think about what happens when you process a transaction, the client uh, that you have in your hand needs to issue uh, an identifier that is going to uniquely identify the transaction. It's client issued. You send it to the server, uh, and then the server, you know, once it processes, gives you back an identifier that it has assigned. Um, but when you're unable to even process the first one, you actually need to issue basically a reversal called a void with your client ID that you generated. Uh, and so all the clients that were trying to process credit cards, you know, there were uh, over 10,000 concurrent requests over that one minute where the network outage uh, happened, basically sent voids uh, to our system, except we forgot an index on that query, and because it happens really, really rarely, we had never noticed. And so all of a, all of a sudden, all of our database fell down, uh, and it took an hour to recover. And it really took like pulling all the cords, shutting down all the machines, and then rebooting the system. Uh, and you know, that's the kind of thing where the root cause is a copy-paste and a little networking issue. Uh, but really, there were just so many things that were broken. Uh, you know, it, it's just kind of pointless to actually try to pinpoint you know, the root cause. It's always you know, a combination of many, many different things. One more thing um, that I'll leave you with is uh, kind of a template for postmortems. Um, again, very simple thing to have. Uh, it could be a Google Doc, it could be a Markdown document. Uh, it's just a good way to actually have a standard of performance for what a postmortem is, to basically raise the bar on what do we intend a postmortem to be, uh, to basically raise the temperature when everybody goes into a room, they know that either you know, someone actually spent time to compiling that report or someone will need to spend time compiling that report. And it's something that we actually care about as a company. Uh, and so all those little things uh, actually kind of raise the temperature on you know, the importance of that, of that action. And then one thing, you know, the, the one thing that I'll leave you with and, and kind of end the talk by is this concept of proportional investing. Uh, you know, we were speaking about the number of action items that you need to have out of postmortems. The thing is, if you get more and more outages, uh, you know, something systemic is going on. And a nice metric to have in, your, in the back of, of your mind is, you know, this concept of proportional investing, which is if you're spending 20 hours of your week to fight outages, you should spend 20 hours of your week to actually improve your system. If it's 30 hours, then spend 30 hours improving it. If it's two hours, then two hours. And this way, it's kind of a self-stabilizing system where when things go bad, you spend more time making them better. When things are fine, you don't overinvest in your technology. You don't overinvest in all your tools. Um, and over time, if you're actually you know, true to kind of this principle, you're able to kind of keep you know, a, a nice kind of up and down and, and gentle way to actually manage and improve your system. And over a long period of time, you know, two, three, four years, you know, you'd be amazed by the amount of progress that you're able to do through simple things like that. Um, I'll just go through these quickly. Um, you can all read them, uh, but what I would really say is technology is great, uh, culture is even more powerful. And you know, a culture of safety and a culture of, of, um, uh, of building code and, and building things in a way that is you know, focused on the long term you know, doesn't happen by accident. It's something that needs to be really kind of built in every step of the way. Like we did a, a big survey of many, many different little things. Um, and all those things are actually important in kind of building the, the, overall, uh, the overall company. Uh, so with that, you know, I'll, take, I'll be happy to take any questions and uh, take it from there. Thanks.
So automated testing in. And how that, if you go back to your slides, do you have like four things on your, like, on your automated system slide, uh, uh, testing slide? And one of the, I think the fourth thing is it, like, it, it like, limits your variance in your system. Oh, yeah. This one? Yeah, well, yeah, it calls the variance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. So usually when you're developing, um, you know, you're super deep in your code. You're like super deep in building your system. And you assume that things around you are going to behave one way. It could be very simple things such as, I assume that no one is going to call my function with uh, a null value. Um, you know, if you're in C or C++ or Java. And so what I mean by that is, you know, it's very easy to write a test that says, well, if you pass null into this function, I expect it to throw a null pointer exception. So you're basically encoding the fact that, you know, this method is not supposed to do null checking. It's supposed to throw up. Uh, and so it's even more powerful than writing it in documentation because documentation will get stale. Uh, and, you know, it, you know, take that concept and you can kind of expand it to many other things. You know, it's like, uh, I'm getting this, you know, object or this message from this other system. I expect those five fields to be filled in. If they're not, then you know my function will just misbehave, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how does that translate to um, your like your like takeover style like tests? Because when you're writing tests on that level, yeah. Uh, I mean, to some extent, those uh, those tests, which are you know the gold tests or or uh, tests which are kind of expressive, uh, by definition, they're encoding they're encoding invariance because they're encoding you know the behavior of your system, which should be an invariant. Meaning, you know, regardless of the implementation of your system, which is meant to be fluid, uh, you know, it needs to behave exactly that way. Uh, so it's yeah, it's another kind of super macro way to encode an invariant. No. Any other? Yep. How do you handle um, code ownership in the sense when you have a stable code base that's been tested and I'm sure everything works, but people that originally wrote this left the company many, many years ago? Yeah. And now it's kind of like lower in the company. Yeah. So, what do you think is the best approach? Like, is, it, is it kind of like, not, not best practice, but is it sensible to actually to forcefully go through all of the code and kind of like touch all the code to make sure that everybody in the company is actually aware? Hmm. So basically, if I understand the question, is you've got a large code base that is mostly stable. The most people who wrote the code base are not in the company anymore. Like, what do you do? Um, well, first of all, you try to retain your people better. <laughs> uh, but realistically, um, you know, there's going to be two scenarios. One is you actually have automated testing, which I assume, given the fact that you said it was stable, um, and so you should be able to rely on that to be able to evolve it. Um, but if you really have you know, a team that actually has no idea of what the system is doing, like you will need to proceed with, you know, extreme caution, right? You'll need to evolve that system, you know, much slower than you would evolve other systems because uh, there's a difference between being able to do a change to a code base and, you know, modifying, you know, with the alignment of whatever the architectural mindset was there. Right? And so before you can do big strides and big modification to that code base, you actually need to get an understanding of what were the architectural, you know, what was the architectural mindset uh, that actually produced that system um, to be able to kind of predict, you know, two years from now, that's where we need to go. And so you can basically have a spine uh, that basically is going to help you go through that. Um, on the other side, if you don't have any test on a major code base, that very, very little people know. Uh, step number one would be probably to start you know, testing, or at least doing some scenario testing at a macro level uh, to make sure that you know, subtle changes that seem innocuous 
don't have major impact on, on the outside. Does that answer the question? But what, what would be the best approach other than trying to retain the people to actually somehow still have awareness of what what is in that code over the years? Uh, testing is probably really good. Uh, like you know, testing we're going to have ninety percent unit testing, ten percent um, large tests or scenario tests, uh, and then design docs. Uh, like design docs are actually if they're well written, can be very useful. Um, you know, they have a tendency to get stale, but at least they give you an idea of you know, the thought process that went into building it, uh, so that you're able to kind of understand the pitfalls that were considered and were not taken. Yeah. yeah. When you talked about gold tests, you said that only certain engineers were authorized to change them. Um, what's the reason behind that extra level of protection on the tests? I mean, it sounds like you have experience in that. Yeah, yeah. So the experience, so the question is, you know, when you have gold tests, uh, you know, I said there, there should be a limited set of people who can touch it, you know, why? Why the extra layer and the extra protection? Um, so it comes from, uh, you know, the, my previous company was a trading firm, and so we basically, uh, you know, operated a big kind of a brokerage, uh, and so uh, we deployed continuously to production, literally every five minutes, um, and you could come into the company, you know, commit code on your first day, and it would launch. Like, we actually had someone in an interview build a full feature that made it by the time they left the company, by the time they left, you know, the, the uh, you know, at the end of the interview day. Uh, and so we were kind of afraid that, you know, major bugs would be introduced in the accounting system. Uh, and so it was mostly a realization that with all of our awesome testing, uh, we are still kind of vulnerable to making rudimentary mistakes that would pass all of our unit tests uh, but not, but actually cause, you know, some, some failure. And so by restricting to basically the three people who were the most knowledgeable on that training system, it added friction into the process where if you're touching anything remotely, you know, you actually have to have a real interaction with that person, you know, sit down with them, uh, and, you know, is, is kind of forcing function there. So one is technological, which is, you know, you're going to have, first of all, you're going to create those gold tests and you're going to put more thoughts into, you know, if, if push come to shove, what are the things that I really need to protect? And two, you know, it's kind of this realization, this humility that, you know, with all of our super technology, uh, things still bad could happen. It's good to force interactions. Maybe last one or none. All right, cool, thanks.